All right, perfect. Okay, so I already gave everybody the heads up that we are recording. Um, and again, now that we are officially starting, I really just want to make the point in asking you guys to put your cameras on if you feel comfortable. I absolutely love to see all your faces. Um, I do scroll down and look at everyone's faces. It makes me feel like I'm a part of a community. Um, and it gives me something that I'm missing when, but I'm missing what we used to have in the office. So please try if you can. All right, so welcome to, welcome students and staff to the SEEK Social Impact Panel. This is our eighth year hosting the event within SEEK and our first time doing it virtually. I acknowledge um, that a lot of us, myself included, would rather be holding this space in person. Um, however, the topic of social impact, in my opinion, is of high importance, and I'm very grateful that we can continue the conversation um, via Zoom, and especially in a time where connection feels limited. Um, I cannot think of a better moment to be discussing not just the civic engagement of others, who you will hear from in the keynote panel, um, but of what each individual in this Zoom room, that means you guys, uh, can do to create a positive change in their own worlds. So in looking back at the history of SEEK and how it was founded, our program was born out of civic engagement and advocacy. If it were not for others using their voices and platforms to help grant access to those who were being denied the opportunity to higher education, I'm not quite sure where we would be today. Um, not only was the need to grant access voiced, uh, but most importantly, it was fought for, showing us that sometimes um, not accepting no for an answer is okay and valuable. I'd like to highlight the importance of our own individual voices and why we should continue to have these conversations with others. Through my experience in working with people, I have noticed um, that when the topic of social impact comes up, there is usually a sense that one person cannot do much to change the very large world around us. Uh, this can sometimes feel defeating. However, I'd like all of, all of you to remember that it was the voices of our predecessors who continued the conversation on what they believed was right and did not take no for an answer. And it is because of them that we have the opportunity today to be in a program like SEEK and hold this space together today. Um, what I hope you leave with today and listening to other people's experiences is recognition and understanding that your voice does matter. Something as small as beginning to get comfortable with yourself, being curious and speaking up when you need clarification is more valuable than our society portrays it to be. I'd like to remind the students that you're currently in a moment of your lives where you're allowed to explore the different worlds around you and make mistakes. Because essentially that's what higher education gives you the opportunity to do. Take advantage of the different resources we have here on campus, even the virtual ones, because this is the best way to learn about yourself and figure out what your voice is and how you'll utilize it moving forward. Um, I will now pass it on to my colleague, Heather Schultz, who will be introducing our keynote speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. I just wanna go through a quick agenda of today. So we heard from Sasha, and next up is the keynote speech from Michelle Hope. Then we'll have the student panel, then a Q&A with the student panel, and then we'll separate into breakout rooms with the student leaders and the panelists. And last but not least, we have concluding remarks from Casey Chapman. So I have the privilege of announcing Michelle Hope, a friend of mine who is a dedicated sexologist, educator, and reproductive justice activist as the special keynote speaker of our event. Following the killing of George Floyd, Michelle Hope, she protested for nine days and she documented her protest journey through IG stories and BET published the videos that she put together. So I just want to share a quick snippet of that before I turn the mic to Michelle Hope, who, by the way, just celebrated her birthday yesterday. So happy birthday, Michelle.
What's up, everybody? My name is Michelle Hope. I am a sexologist, an educator, and a reproductive justice activist. I spent 18 years in the classroom teaching about reproductive justice and equity. And when I saw the death of George Floyd, I decided not enough is enough. I'm about to hit these streets. I had to go beyond the classroom. So I marched, and these are my protest diaries. I'm definitely not sure how many miles I have walked. Uh, so there's that. I can't believe I also shut down the freeway today. I sat down on it. I dropped it like it was hot on that freeway, that West Side Highway. So I will share the entire link to the video that was published on BET.com with all of you in the Zoom chat. And now, with further ado, Michelle Hope, our wonderful keynote speaker. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me today and allowing me the opportunity to come into the classroom uh, with all, all of you. <coughs> Excuse me, I got <clears throat> got a little choked up there. Um, but thank you so much for allowing me to be here to talk to you about the importance of civic engagement. Um, a lot of you may be experiencing your first opportunity to vote this year. And for a long time, you know, voting was not something I was super keen to. I was like, yeah, I'll vote, whatever. Um, but that is a part of our civic responsibility. And let me be clear when I say uh, we have failed young people for generations by not educating you to the importance of your civic engagement and what is your responsibility to your community. We tend to want to complain about the way things are, yet we sometimes don't get involved in ways we should because we either think that the challenges our communities are facing are insurmountable or we feel as though our voices do not matter. Well, I'm here to tell you that that is a lie. And one of the ways I have come to understand this better is to really recognize that your vote does count even if you live in New York and you're like, but it's a democratic state, Miss Michelle, my vote doesn't matter, lies. And those are the lies that the oppressors want us to believe. While sure, you know, the electoral college is probably gonna go uh, democratic in New York, but the president is just an individual who quote unquote runs the country, but Again, as we failed you in not understanding how uh, the different branches of legislation work, there is so much more to be done at a local level and so much more impact that we have with our voices through our votes at that local level. If you want to see bail reform, you want to see things change in your local community, that is local elections, which come up in 2021. So while we have this energy and this veracity that we've seen all summer and we took to the streets, we have to take it to the polls. And not just the election happening in less than 20 days, but we need to keep the same energy all throughout next year to when we start looking at the elections for house and city officials, okay? So I just kind of wanted to establish that first and foremost. You want to be or you want to see a change in your community, well, it's up to you to get involved. And that's what we came to discuss today is civic engagement. You know, by definition, um, civic engagement is how we engage through participation in addressing 
areas of concern in our local communities, right? And it doesn't matter how young you are or how little you have in your bank account. What you do have is the knowledge that you are, some, you are in someone's constituency, which means you elect them and then they go to work for you. They are your voice. But if you don't educate yourself to the, the policies that they believe in, to understanding the laws and the bills that are on the ballot, you really are kind of shooting blind, okay? And let's face it, nothing good comes from shooting blind. You're shooting from the hip, bam, bam, bam. So it is important for you to get involved in a way that you can educate yourself to these spaces. Additionally, you have all that you need at your fingertips. Well, yes, we would all like to be in a lecture hall right now. I know I do much better in my engagement and speaking when I'm in a physical space. But because we are all remote, everybody has put everything online. And for your demographic, a lot of that is on social media, right? And, and I wanna be, again, I'm gonna stress this. A hashtag and a retweet and a post is cool, it's great, but you cannot stop there. That is not enough. You can't just, and I've said this time and time again, throughout this summer, which I have coined, Black Lives Matter summer camp, okay? Listen, it's, it's not eight, six weeks, eight weeks, and it's over. No, 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 no. Just like that retweet might spread a message and somebody might look at it, or you might get another follower or extra few likes. That is not enough. You must become active. And a part of becoming active is getting involved, right? Um, as I marched this summer and, and the BET protest diaries was nine days, <clears throat> I spent the entire summer either uh, marching or organizing marches. Uh, some of the marches that I was a part of, <clears throat> we shut down the FDR for the Black Women's March. We shut down the West Side Highway, I think three times. Um, most recently, about two and a half, three weeks ago, um, the Black Women's Coalition I'm a part of, we shut down the Brooklyn Bridge on a Friday night um, to draw attention to the Breonna Taylor case. I am super happy and proud to say that night that we shut the Brooklyn Bridge down for 90 minutes, number one, it never been done. Number two, other organizers told us that we would not be able to do it. Um, and we did it. We made the point and we had no arrests. We had no property damage. We had no injuries. So this is or was my part of civic engagement this summer through protest, okay? That is a part of civic engagement. Um, out of curiosity, because you know I'm a teacher for real, who knows the five elements of um, the Second Amendment? Does anybody know right off the top of your head? Looking for a hand, looking for a hand, don't be afraid. Uh, and this is important. This is important for you to know because this is a part of civic engagement, okay? Um, first Amendment, actually it's the First Amendment. So it is protest. Um, it is um, freedom of religion. It is freedom of the press. It is um, freedom, uh, if I'm getting this wrong, somebody tell me, I know somebody's Googling it. Uh, so press, speech, religion, protest, and organizing, assembly. Thank you very much. These are all your rights. This is in, this is your right as an American. That is a part of civic engagement. Here's the, here's the kicker of civic engagement and why people told us we couldn't shut down a bridge. Because Eric, you're gonna get arrested. And police try to convince you that you do not have that right. That's the thing about civic engagement. The individuals and communities that need civic engagement the most oftentimes have the most challenges realizing it through fear mongering, through tactics of uh, disinformation or lack of education around what your actual rights 
are. But it's most important for us as we sit here, as we are a part of SEEK programs, as we have benefited from the establishment of SEEK programs, it is up to us to get involved in these types of engagements, right? So protest, that's cool enough. Get you some good Instagram photos. Great, love it. But here's the other part of that. You also need to engage in ways to get people to fill out the census. I don't know if any of you have been watching the news. Uh, President Trump uh, uh, decided that they would end the census immediately. Originally, he put a stop to that. And why do you think he put a stop to that? Because if people like you and I did not fill out the census, that means we are not counted. That means that when they start to look at where funding needs to go, we don't get the money we need to improve the communities that we live in. The census, that is civic engagement. Helping people understand how to register to vote, that is civic engagement. All of you applying to become poll workers, that is civic engagement. I applied to become a poll worker. And I, I know, think about it like this. When you go to the polls, if you've ever been, if you're old enough to have already gone, who are the people that you see at the polls? I can tell you, they don't look like me. I can tell you, they do not look like my trans brothers and sisters. They do not look like my black and brown brothers and sisters. And the reason that has been done by design is because they want to further voter intimidation. That is voter disenfranchisement. If we are a nation that should be reflected through our politics, then that means our poll workers should reflect the communities we live in. But that also means that we as young people, we have to take responsibility and take action to get involved in these spaces, to apply, to say, you know what, I can give a day. I know I don't wanna get up at five to get to the polls, to be a poll worker, but that's one day out of your life that could help encourage somebody that looks like you to wanna to get involved in civic engagement. And aside from that, I want you for a moment to think about the individuals who bring their children to the polls. And they would have an opportunity to look at someone that looks like them and say, you know what, maybe I need to care a little bit more. Because I am a firm believer that for you to really understand what you can achieve, you must be able to see someone that looks like you who has already achieved it. We cannot hide, admire behind the shadows of what we think a poll worker should look like, what we think a politician should look like, what we think an organizer or a leader should look like, because we are the leaders. I mean, maybe not me, because I'm a little older than you, but I think you get where I'm going with this. You are the future. And it is up to you to provide an example of what it looks like. We have to remove these ideas of these cookie cutter norms of what politicians look like and what um, leaders look like. Our leaders should reflect the America we live in. And I know that the America I live in is a diverse community made up of individuals who are red and black and brown and white and yellow and purple and green. We are straight, we are gay, we are bi, we are trans, we are gender non-conforming. That's the beauty of America. We are but an amalgamation of all the lives lived before us, all the ancestors whose backs we stand on to continue to fight to make a more equitable space for all of us. But if we do not do it, then who will? My mom um, often says to me, because as a, a, a black, queer, biracial woman in this space of, you know, Black Lives Matter summer camp, 
Um, I am tired of explaining to white people what white privilege is. I am exhausted. I feel like it is not my responsibility. And my mother, a white woman, third wave feminist, so there's a lot we could unpack there, but that's another class. She always says to me, Michelle, if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? And let's face it, she didn't say that. She quoted somebody. Um, but it makes me think. And when I see on the internets and the Twitters and the Facebooks where people, and, and I'm going to call it out, where black women and black women want to say, it's not my job to teach you lies. Because if I don't teach you my truth as a black queer woman, I am allowing you to go to the Google and then the Google will decide for you what my truth is. Is it exhausting? Absolutely. Do I get annoyed with people? Most definitely. But we have to understand that if we just say, there's an internet, go to the Googles. Google is a private company, right? And a lot of what you don't know, I worked on a presidential campaign. And if you've seen this, um, the social dilemma, can you just drop a, a, an emoji or a clap for me or whatever the reactions are? Okay, so a few of you have seen this. If you have not seen it, I would recommend you see it. Because here's the thing, there's something called geo-targeting. Okay, we use this in political, we use this in political advertising. If you are in New York and you Google the black experience, you'll get one set of information because of the algorithms that come up in your area as well as your history, the, the history of your Google. If you are in Florida and you look up the experience of, of black America or whatever, you'll get something totally different. I had the pleasure of during a week of action for Breonna Taylor to teach a, I, I hosted a digital teaching on the history of reproductive oppression on black and brown women throughout the United States. And a woman in that, uh, a, a, a white woman in that in Florida said, how do I teach my children about anti-racism and how to be anti-racist when all the information I have access to is racist? And that hit home because we make these assumptions that people have the internet and can just go on the Google. But depending on where you are is going to determine what information you get. So you have to dig deeper. It is your responsibility to share your experience and educate people because you are the, you are the expert of the culture you are raised in. You are the expert of your community. Hence the reason you must become more civically engaged. You must go to your community board meetings and find out what's on the ballot. What are the zoning practices? Are they about to put another liquor store into your neighborhood when you know you need a community center or a food pantry? It's up to you to use your voice. And I don't, I, I know I have a very few set of minutes, but a couple things I want to remind you of. Um, a couple quotes I like to leave people with. These are important to me. So first one uh, is from Malcolm X. Malcolm X stated, education is the passport to the future. For tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for today. All of you are in college. Education is the purest form of resistance and has been brown full education and limiting our access to education is how they enslaved us for many, many years. Knowledge is power, very important. So it should be up to you to educate those around you, even in the most minuscule ways, at happy hour, over the dinner table. Some of you are gonna have to have hard conversations with your family members. Trust me, I know that all too well. But that is where you lean in. Secondarily, um, don't take the burdens of the world's problems upon yourself, but don't ignore them either. The work is not put upon you to complete, but rather you are not exempt from trying. So even though the problems that we're faced with today are giant and huge, 
You cannot turn a blind eye or stick your head into the sand. You at least have to try to move the needle slightly in whatever way you can. And that could be as simple as volunteering at a food bank to see and hear what's going on signing up to be a poll worker, donating some time at your local community center. Get to know your community. And I say all of that to say, the reason civic engagement is important, and if you remember nothing of this speech, remember this, who takes care of us? We take care of us. Carry that with you forever. Who protects us? We protect us. And on that note, I just want to thank you again for all of you being here. Follow me on Instagram because I do put a lot of this information out there. It's at MH Sexpert, and I will put that in the chat. Um, stay involved, be involved. Like, I'm here. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, it's a pleasure hearing you speak and an honor to have you here with us today. Um, so speaking on elections and how we can get involved, we decided to just gauge, even though registration ended on October 9th, we want to know, especially my students, because it was extra credit, I want to know who's registered to vote. So I'm going to pull up a poll. So it's anonymous. So just please answer for our knowledge. Awesome. I don't know if you guys can see the results the way I'm seeing it because I'm the host, but this is looking looking pretty good so far. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to keep it up for maybe 10 more seconds because there's about 20 people who haven't participated. Okay. All right, so can I show the results? Let's see. Yes, I'm going to share the results with you. Um, can everybody see the results? Yes. So not bad. Um, I'm happy that we are out there getting our voices heard in whatever way we can. Um, and to those, and I do understand that some of our students are still 17 and we are not allowed to register just yet. Um, however, it'd be ideal for me in this lifetime to see it at 100%. Um, thank you for participating. All right. Um, up next, we're going to begin the panel. Um, and one of my lovely, lovely students, Michelle Campos, is going to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Campos. I'm currently a senior majoring in corporate communications with a minor in psychology. I'm also a very proud recipient of the SEEK program and a former peer mentor. Outside of my academics, I've been very active on campus Thanks to SEEK, I was introduced to a professional development organization called ALPHA, which stands for the Association of Latino Professionals for America. I serve as director of events and cater events to Baruch's student body, more specifically students like those in this room. My advocacy with ALPHA has allowed me to empower the next generation of leaders like those on this panel. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, student panelists. Um, First up, we have Christina, who will introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I just want to say thank you all for having me here today. I'm super proud to be here with everyone. Um, my name is Christina Cosme. I'm currently a SEEK student here at Baruch College. I'm majoring in marketing with a, a, a minor in communication studies. I will be graduating this December, so I'm super excited about that. Um, I love, I've always been passionate about social impact. Um, I love volunteering at my local food bank. And just this past summer, I was actually an ambassador for the nonprofit organization, Do Something, where I helped to inform, educate, and register young people to vote. And yeah, I'm just super excited to be here and talking with you all today. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, up next, our panelist is Kim, who will, uh, Kimberly, sorry, who will introduce herself. Hi guys, thank you for having me. My name is Kim Kazdal. I'm currently a senior at Baruch College studying public affairs with a minor in French. I'm also a Sikh student and I'm really proud of it because how would we be here? Well, how would I be here without the opportunity? Currently, I'm a 
intern at the Department of State at the Central American Bureau, um, which is actually like a dream to me as a Nicaraguan American. And that's kind of where my civic engagement mind stems from is my heritage truly. Outside of my internship, I also was the VP of Legislative Affairs for the Baruch's undergraduate student government last year. And now my best friend is actually the VP of Legislative Affairs. Um, and my role there really just focused on getting students registered, getting people to participate, organizing rallies. So if anyone's interested, I can totally help you guys out and just reach out. So thank you for having me. I'm excited. Okay, thank you. Um, now we have Richard who will introduce himself. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Richard Reyes. I'm currently a junior here at Baruch majoring in finance with a minor in mathematics. Some of you may already know me since I am a tutor for the SEEK program. Um, so if you know me, you know, hi once again. Um, so throughout my journey here at Baruch, um, I currently serve as the VP of Legislative Affairs, where my main incentive is to really give the resources to students and young voters alike um, within our online environment so that you can be actively engaged. Um, through Instagram on USG Baruch, I've done um, many videos on how to get registered through the multiple ways and hosted an annual, um, New York, an annual National Voter Registration Day event where I partnered with New York City Votes and New York City Census. Um, some of the students here actually attended the event, so that was amazing. Um, apart from that, I have done community um, outreach and I have done community service abroad in Puerto Rico for two weeks with the CUNY Service Corps. So that was an amazing experience. And overall, you know, there's no clear um, structure or industry. You know, my minor, my major is finance. You don't have to major in politics or anything of the sorts to be actively engaged within politics and civic engagement. All right, thank you so much. So um, now I believe we're gonna get started with our panel. So I now wanna pose this question to the panel. Who or what introduced you to civic engagement? We can start in the order that you all introduce yourselves in. So Christina, you can go first. Okay, so I first started becoming civically engaged when I was in high school. Um, my best friend at the time, she would always volunteer, frequently volunteer. And I one time joined her in a, a food bank and this is where I helped to distribute food to families in need. And it was with that, with that experience where I really sparked my interest in social impact and I wanted to continue that well into my college years. And with SEEK, there's so many opportunities to volunteer and give back to the community. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was an ambassador for the nonprofit organization Do Something, and my role was to encourage and register young people to vote. I created content that um, helped reach over 500 student accounts. I, reached, I directly messaged over 700 college freshmen about voting. And yeah, I'm super proud about that because I think civic engagement is so cool because literally everyone could get involved and it's up to you to be passionate about it and want to make a change for everyone around you and your community. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Kim, you can go next. Who or what introduced you to civic engagement? Awesome. So growing up, going and visiting my grandma in Nicaragua often, I saw a lot of inequality, particularly for people of color. And I just didn't understand why, where you live geographically or why the color of your skin impedes how engaged you are in your community. And it, so at a, at a young age, I, I just knew that it's not right and I wanted to be involved. So I started volunteering at a school in Nicaragua every summer I would go. And then I kind of continued my volunteer work here in the States with Port in Puerto Rico. And now I'm at Baruch last year as a VP of Legislative Affairs. So last year, my goal was really just to get kids to participate in particularly knowing their right of, to protest and then knowing their right to assembly and I know a lot of people have different approaches and some people can't go out in person especially because of COVID but that's where it stems from and I think that the right to assembly is so important so I encourage it if you can stay safe though because of COVID. Thanks Kim. Um, so Richard you're the last one to answer who or what introduced you to civic engagement? No, of course so I would say from a young age, I knew of politics mainly because it indirectly and directly affected, you know, my community and members of my family. Um, I grew up in a community that was heavily um, an immigrant population. And so at an early age, I saw how, you know, policies within our system affected individuals living within my community and, you know, alike 
some of my family members. Um, so right from that moment, you know, I was actively engaged, always on immigration advocacy, and you know, understanding that although you are voting um, at times for yourself, you're also voting for those who cannot, and you know, your vote has consequences um, nonetheless. Um, and even now today, I am often, you know, participating within you know these advocacy aspects. You know, I think the very moment, if I had to be clear with it would be the election of 2016. I think that election very much solidified my involvement within politics and civic engagement. Um, I see now that we're actually living the consequences of you know, our decision in that moment. And even now and today in SEEK, I've been an active member in you know, my role currently as VP of Legislative Affairs and making sure that students understand you know, the dynamics of it and how our vote is important and how we have to be actively engaged in our local communities overall. Okay, thank you, Richard. I really love what you said about your vote counting for those who can't vote. So for myself, I'm not a US citizen yet, which means I can't vote as of right now. But um, I do thank a lot of my personal friends who, you know, kind of cast their vote for me. Um, so thank you all to the panelists. Uh, my next question, since you brought it up, Richard, uh, many in the audience will be voting for the first time. So I'm curious, what are the consequences of not voting? So Christina, you can start us off. Yeah, I think um, every every vote matters. Everyone should use their vote this this year because it's such a huge election. This is this is probably one of the biggest elections in the history of our country. You know, we're going through so much. We're going through a global pandemic. We're going through racial injustice. We're going through economic turmoil, climate change. There's so many issues that are happening right now, and we need to use our vote our vote and make a change. And we need to elect officials that care about these issues have policy set forward. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Kim, you can go next. Yeah, so I just think that if you don't vote, then it's very easy to become complacent. And I live on Long Island, and actually I live in a town that's actually predominantly blue collar, red. <laughs> yeah, enough said. But um, I hear a lot of my peers complaining about current policies by the Trump administration, but they they don't vote. And then they're not civically engaged. So I think that that's just very frustrating. And it's, it's our duty to vote, for sure. And you can't complain about things if you're not civically engaged, to be blunt. Thanks, Kim. Um, Richard, you can go now. The one thing that has always stuck with me since my freshman year was something that my counselor, Andrew, stated. Um, he said um, that, you know, whether or not you like politics and whether or not you're engaged, you know, action and policies are still going to be put into effect and you're still going to see the consequences of such policies and to be ignorant about those aspects and not casting your vote is being like Kim said complacent with you know certain policies affecting you and your local communities so voting is extremely important and imperative especially now like um, as was stated this is probably the most important election given the current circumstances that we're facing um, and just understanding that your national election, of course, is really important, but of course, your local elections have power as well. You know, change start in, start, starts often at the local level and builds its way up. So make sure you're knowledgeable about your local candidates, what's happening in your congressional districts and your senatorial districts um, and all of that. Okay, thank you. So to kind of bounce off that question, um, how do each of you distinguish a quote, good candidate from a quote, bad candidate? Um, Christina, you can start us off. Um, well, I think the first thing is you have to think introspectively about the issues you care about first. Um, so if you care about climate change, you care about healthcare, you care about education, you need to make sure that you are backing, you're voting for people who care about these issues at hand because they need to, and you need to make sure that they have a plan set forward that could tackle these issues or concerns. So I think that's the first step. And also researching your candidates and don't listen to everything they say, also fact check them because you know, there's so many things that are said on the other side that are just crazy and they could be lies. So I would make sure you research what they're saying, just look at what they've done and look at what they're going to do to decide if someone's a good candidate or not. Thank you. Um, Kim, you can go next now. Kind of from a more personal level, I look at it this way to decide if a candidate is good or not. If you vote for that candidate, are they going to hurt the people you love and yourself? You can't just think about yourself and your own personal interests because honestly, also as a Long Islander, I find that a lot of Long Islanders 
think about their personal interests and not how a certain vote can affect their community. And I'm Hispanic, so community is very prominent in our culture. So think about how your vote will affect the people you love in your community. And if you think that person's going to hurt those people in your community, maybe you shouldn't vote for them. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. I agree. Um, Richard, you can go next now. Everyone else has touched on one of the the very main clear points, you know, um, very much on the community and research aspect. Make sure that you research these candidates. Do not just go into the ballot and just cast, um, you know, any person that you just see just because, you know, you're just trying to finish the ballot because you only care about the national election. Like I said, your local elections are very important and you should be doing your, your research on behalf of this. Reach out to organizations such as New York City Votes, who actually help you out to get registered to vote, who help you find the resources of how to find this information to know about your candidates. And make sure to actually, you know, reach out to these candidates, have a conversation with them, meet them, go to their events, see what they're all about. You know, especially now within um, COVID, you know, people are having online events. Make sure that you're going out, learning more about these candidates and distinguishing yourself. Like, is this a person that I would vote for? And like Kim said, would this vote you know, affect others within my community. And I think that's very imperative. All right, thank you. Um, I just saw in the chat what Michelle wrote and also Richard, you kind of touched upon it a little bit, which is contacting um, those who are running um, locally. So my next question is, uh, what are some ways that you all um, get your elected officials to listen to you? Um, just kind of any advice that you would share to those um, that are in this room right now who are kind of unsure on how to um, approach those who are running in their district. Um, so I would definitely say that you should get to know your local representatives. Um, you can visit house.gov and you can search, you can put in your zip code and you'll find your representatives there. And definitely call them, email them, do whatever you can to make sure your voice is being heard. Because sometimes you kind of have to push and pressure these politicians to make sure that there's actual change. So I would definitely say, talk to them and encourage your friends and family to also call and email them as well, because the more the merrier. All right, thank you. Kim, you can go next. So I think there are two ways. First, understand the ability you have to make change. So you organize. You want to see change? Contact people and make a group and organize and do it yourself also. If you feel like someone's not representing your interests or no one's taking action, do it yourself and contact the right people that can help you. Also, another way is I'm sure people in your community are already organizing. So you just have to look online and see who those people are that are organizing, what organizations exist in your community and email them, shoot them an email or call them and be like, hey, is there any way I can help? Those are the biggest thing, but I'm really big on organizing and protests, so. All right, thanks, Kim. Um, Richard, you're the last one, so. Yeah, so I think people need to remember, you know, these, these elected officials, very emphasizing the point of elected, you know, they're there to hear your voices and your concerns. You have the right to make sure that they are hearing these concerns in one way or another. Um, like my peers have said on this panel, organizing, reaching out, emailing, contacting them, calling them. Make sure that you're on them. Make sure that you're calling them out on things that are not correlating with what you, what they're preaching about. You know, when you vote for them, you vote for their agenda and what they're going to do for your community and for their representatives as a whole. And so if they're not doing that, make sure that you're going out and making sure that you're calling them out. Make sure that they're staying true to what you have voted them into doing. Um, so make sure you just keep that keep that momentum up, never, you know, be, be afraid to call them and, you know, do all these different things. All right, thank you. Um, for our last question, I wanna ask you all this, and Kim, you kind of touched upon this a little bit about how your vote can affect um, those in your community, those who you personally love. Um, so in our current political climate, how do you manage to stay positive if the decisions that are being made are against your beliefs or negatively affect you? So Christina, you can start us off. Um, well, I think there's just, this year, there's just so much going on. Like I mentioned, we are in a global pandemic. Uh, so many things are happening. Like you could turn on the news and you could feel overwhelmed. So I think it's important to also take some self-care, take some time for yourself and just sort of get away from everything and do something that's going to help you. So if you like exercising, listening to music, talking to a friend, anything, just try to get your mind off of it. But also when you come back to it, I would say, definitely know that there's a difference between the state and the federal government. The president doesn't hold all the powers. We also have powers in the local officials. So know that 
again, you have to contact them. You have to be a part of being civically engaged in order to make sure that there's real change. So contact them, call them, email, pressure them because they represent us. Thanks, Christina. Um, Kim, you can go next. I'm not even gonna lie. Me and Richard discussed this question yesterday because it, it can be difficult to stay positive in such a crazy, chaotic political climate right now. But overall, I hate to be cliche, but it's true, like, we are the future. So things might not be working out right now, but if we set our minds to it and we do the right things, then the future will be better. So I think, personally, I just think about my community and my peers and the, the ability that we have to make real change. So I'd like to think to the future. All right. Thank you, Kim. Um, Richard? Yeah, I definitely agree that at times it's a bit un it's a bit overwhelming you know at times I, I i feel very stressed out with the current policies in place and you know the current administration doing what they're doing at the federal level um but i do think about the future um you know these elect elections happen every year in one way or another you know people are up for election here and around there and so think about things you know of course policies enacted but remember these officials are not there forever they're elected there you know, and they can very much be voted out um, if we see a candidate that's better and, and it's willing to go for, you know, what we believe in and what we want for our local communities. Um, you know, I, I'm always emphasizing, you know, change happens at the local level and builds its way up. Make sure that you're showing support for candidates that have the same values that you, that are representing your communities in the best light um, and push forward, you know, like teamwork makes the dream work like they said in the chat right now by Andrew, um, and make sure that you actually advocate for these candidates. Don't let it slip by. Um, make sure that you hold them on and making sure that they actually get elected and making sure that, you know, change actually happens. Not maybe now, um, but hopefully in the future. All right. Thank you so much, panelists, for all of your answers and your insight. Um, I love seeing the chat, like you mentioned, Richard, everyone kind of popping off. So as we're ending this panel, we're going to transition into breakout rooms, where hopefully you all keep this momentum in those breakout rooms. Um, but don't leave right afterwards. We're going to come back for some closing remarks. So um, we're yeah. going to... Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. So I'm going to be opening all the breakout rooms. So you just have to press the little button to get yourself there. If you are not immediately in a breakout room, don't worry, I'm gonna find you and I'll sign you. So we're gonna be there about 10 minutes. We'll give you guys an opportunity to speak to a panelist. It's assigned randomly and a facilitator and also a student leader. Um, and also give you guys an opportunity to just have a little more, um, I guess just, uh, I don't know how to say it, just comfort in speaking openly since we're in, we're a lot of people in the Zoom room. So I'll see you in about 10 minutes. Hi, Elijah, I'm gonna sign Elijah.
All right, so I see Marisol. I don't know, Aaron, Sashe, Talia, Yawin, the Adele. If you are here, please go to your assigned room. Yes, I think, I think mine just popped up, so I'm going to join that right. room. I'm going to be assigning breakout room three. Marisol, did yours pop up? I can't hear you. It did, but I decided not to go. Excuse me, Marisol. <laughs> All right. Uh, I mean, I can still go. It, it says I still have the option to go if I want to. So. Okay. So I see Lorraine just joined us, and she just left. I am supposed to be in breakout room three. Are you going to stay here? Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I came because if, need, if you needed help, but you don't, right. so I might just leave. <laughs> oh, it's okay. That's fine with me. Um, I am good with that. You are the best. Always, thank you for watching out for me. Mm -hmm. Quick question, how do I go to a breakout room? You gotta click join breakout room. There's not an option. Oh, are you, oh, are you the host of, of this thing? I think if you're the host, you can't go to a breakout room. Really, since when? Always. What, I've never had this issue. Really, so you've gone to breakout rooms before even as the host? Doesn't the host have access to each breakout room? Just no. to join and see? No. That's how it was in the beginning. Really? No, I, I could have sworn I remember the one telling us that a host cannot join a breakout room. Oh, yes, I can. I can do it right now. It just gave me Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. See you, Marisol. Bye. Bye. Marisol, are you there? Yes. Hey, I came back to see if you were here to ask you a quick question. Mm, go ahead. Well, two, two things. I logged into Zoom now, and it had Christy's name on it. Is that okay? I don't know why. What do you mean? Like, I logged in, and it wasn't my name. It was Christy's name. Is it because of the calendar invite you sent me? That's weird. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, may I don't know. All right. That's fine. And then whenever you get a chance, can you check if I got my email changed? Well, did you try? Well, I checked. I think it was either yesterday or the day before. Did you do something I, different? Yeah, I tried it again today. Okay, I'll check. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
right. Um, I am really hoping that we had some good and in-depth conversation in the breakout rooms. I'm looking for Casey. Oh, there you are. I'm going to pass it over to you. Yes, thank you, Sasha. Um, so I just want to really take a moment um, to thank all of our amazing panelists and our keynote speaker and our student leaders for, for and all of you for being here, for showing up today. Um, I'm blown away by, by what I've even learned myself in just this past 60 minutes, right? Um, so I'm just gonna share with you some of my key takeaways um, and then open it up if anybody has any last minute questions. Uh, Sasha, Heather and I will be putting our email in the chat if you need to follow up or we can connect you with any of our panelists. Um, so one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with obviously your voice matters. I know that in this climate, it can be discouraging at times and it can feel like maybe, you know, we're losing hope and things aren't making a big difference, but always know that your voice matters. You making our voice matter then next has to do with organizing, building our community, which I think that's what we have contributed to here today. I'm so thankful to be able to be in this space with you all doing our research and building up within our community and talking to other people and educating other people and educating ourselves um, can make such a difference. And lastly, um, which Michelle, I want to Thank you again so much. I got this from you. you. You shared a little bit about keeping the same energy. It is very easy to feel so motivated after a specific event or make that specific tweet or post or even a specific election. I know obviously there are bigger ones that matter a lot, but it is not just one specific thing. It is keeping that momentum and it is continuing this conversation even when it feels almost impossible. And it's sticking to that community and, and really continuing on to ultimately make the change that we need because it's not going to happen overnight. I don't wanna sound cliche, but this is hard work and you all are leaders. You're all, you are all up for it, we are all up for it and we are in this together. Um, so, I really am inspired. I'm so inspired. I'm like a little shaky because <laughs> I'm so inspired by all of you today. Um, and I want to thank everyone again so, so much. And let's not stop here. Let's not end our Zoom call and say, okay, cool. That was fun. Back to my, my normal way of life. Let's keep it going. Um, Andrew, C Counselor Andrew Lawton has posted several resources in the chat. Let's follow up with it. And um, I really hope that you all were able to get something out of this event today. I know I definitely was. So again, I wanna thank you all and we'll take uh, the last few minutes just to answer any questions. If you have any for the panelists, for our keynote, you can use the chat or uh, turn on your mic. We would love to see your face um, and thank you all. All right. Bye. Does anybody have any questions just for maybe uh, Michelle, Michelle Hope, not the moderator, and Michelle, Michelle. the moderator, um, the seat faculty, whomever? I actually have um, a couple of questions that I was coming up as I was listening to everyone. Um, I have a specific question for um, Ms. Hope. Um, how did you find how did you find the courage and that's and that's including the panelists as well um to go against um the ideology that your voice doesn't matter um <clears throat> so for me i think what really comes up is my own experience with oppression um and my own experience with trauma and for me uh, choosing to go against the grain has been a coping mechanism and an experience that is what we call cathartic. It's a way for me to heal, right? So when I think about the community I came from and how broken it was, or my experience with, um, you know, the Klan, or because I grew up in Indiana, with racism, 
Um, that makes me want to create a world where a younger self doesn't have to have that. Because I remember what that pain was or what that struggle was or what that oppression felt like. So for me, it's about just trying to create a world for my inner child or my younger self that's better than what I experienced. And that's empowering, makes me feel strong. Thank you, that, that definitely answered that. Um, also, um, I have another question as well. Um, how, do, how, do, how do you recommend for, for youth to use their resources in the sense that, for example, um, I, I use 311 because it, it is a resource and um, if whenever, whenever, for example, I see graffiti or I, I see a lot of trash in a certain area, something like that, I, I make a report to 311 and usually within a period of time, they either put a trash can, things like that. So how can we, as a community of young people, teach others to use their resources and that there are resources out there? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One, 311 is amazing. Keep doing that. Two, um, it's mobilizing uh, your, your own constituency group, mobilizing the community you're with, your friends. And right now, because of technology and awesome young people, there's a lot of apps and a lot of like orgs you can find on um, social media that is amazing. There's actually a new one called Community X. Community X is, a, is an app that young people can use to connect to other organizers in their area. And it's just in beta testing, but it can you can uh, connect with other organizers about issues you care about. And it's spaces like that that young people are coming up with that allow you to connect. And once you can build coalitions um, you're, and you organize a, like phone banking for a candidate, instead of phone banking for a candidate, you'll have everybody call and make this report about the trash in this neighborhood. And, and you go ahead and you organize the copy. So you write what the people say and you provide them with the number. And then they just call or they report, they call 311. They say the exact same um, copy. And it's a group of people. Watch that trash can show up a lot faster. Watch that graffiti cleanup show up a lot faster. So it's really just about simple, tiny things you can do. Maybe you have a tech, like you have a group of friends, you can put this in a text, like, hey, everybody, there's a lot of trash in my neighborhood. I could use your help. Here's the 311 number. Here's what you have to say to them. And here's the address and location. Can you please do this? And, and that's, that's just how you get started, right? And then it'll build from there. Thank you, that definitely helped. That was just uh, the two questions I had. Ashley has a question. Ashley, you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, to start off, hold up, sorry. Hi, um, I, it's towards Michelle Hope. I had a question for her as well. Um, I wanted to say, I thought your speech was really good. I, I really enjoyed it. You're so passionate. I really appreciate that because I feel like when a lot of people deliver this topic, it's not, they don't speak with like a passionate voice. So I kind of throw students off, especially with Gen Z. Gen Z is very a passionate um, group of kids, including myself and stuff. Um, my question was like, do you think like education and school has influenced your thoughts of advocacy because I know some kids feel like school has helped them and some kids feel like school has not so how was school like played into a part of this I clearly understand this um, are you asking me what my educational experience was and how that got me here or are you asking how does uh, edu like as a teacher as a professor how has that impacted my views on this because I think those are two different things. Yeah, those are two different questions. Okay, uh, I guess those are two different questions. Um, the I was leaning towards like the first question, like how okay, so, they're personal. Okay, so my experience, <laughs> um, and I think I can answer both of those, but I just wanted to know what order to go in. So I actually was a terrible, terrible, terrible student. Awful. Like 
1.25 graduating GPA from high school. I am dyslexic. I have attention deficit disorder. When I was in my junior year of high school, so when you're dyslexic, they test you. Um, and sometimes when you have dyslexia, you'll have a very high IQ, but you'll have some really like way below average deficiencies in processing and learning. And that was what I had. So, and it was with reading. So when I was a junior in high school, um, I couldn't read. I had a second grade reading level, but because I was an auditory learner, I knew what words were, but if I could use the biggest of words, if you put it on a piece of paper, I would not know how to say it. So for me, when I was going through school, I knew I was oppressed. I knew I wasn't getting adequate education, but at that time, I did not have the means to articulate how it felt to be oppressed and what I needed to do better, what I, because I didn't know. So that experience made me wanna create environments where people can learn in ways that learn best for them. So, right, um, I hated all my teachers. Um, I hated school. And somehow I ended up a teacher for 18 years. I, who knows, who knows, right? But I always, when I taught in the classroom, and maybe this is where that passion comes from or what you see coming across, I need to be able to communicate with you at your level. It doesn't matter how many degrees I have, how many letters are behind my name, if you don't feel like we are right here, you're not listening to me anyways. So it's not about me talking at you. It's about me talking to you. I meet you where you are and I find ways to provide information and education that builds upon your expertise in your life, right? When we think about human development, we think about how people learn, learn anything, relationship skills, uh, voting ideas, social justice perspectives. It is, it is you build upon what you already know. So you have to acknowledge that people are the masters of their own domain, even if that domain is deficient as per the guides of our society. So you meet them where they are, you talk with them about what their needs are, where they think they would feel empowered um, to do better, have more, it's about them, right? Um, and, and you go in with, depending on where you're at, if it's your own community, you are indigenous to that community. I've worked in a lot of disenfranchised communities and I'm neo-indigenous, which means I'm new, I'm a gentrifier here, but I can't come in with that attitude. I come in with, you're the expert. I may know about X, Y, and Z, but you know about this community. So how can we come together and blend? And I think that a part of me understanding that is understanding that people like to be entertained. People like to feel like they can relate. So I just try to relate to as many people as possible and recognize I, I am not up here on a mountaintop, okay? I'm living in a glass house, so I'm not picking up no rocks of judgment, okay? Because let me tell you, honey, we'd be SOL if I did. So that's just relatable. You just gotta, I, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like these politicians, just like these celebrities, you know? I hope that answered that. Yes, um, all right. So again, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I really love your passion and enthusiasm. And it's such a nice uh, break from just speaking to the students. Sometimes they need to hear from someone else. So thank you again. Um, and with that being said, I think we're going to wrap up. I think it was a great event. Thank you all to the panelists, to the leaders, uh, to my fellow colleagues for putting in so much work, Heather and Casey. Um, and if there are any other questions, we put our email addresses in the chat. If you want to get in contact with one of the panelists um, and they are okay with that, we can forward you the email address, but just shoot us an email first. Um, but I think we are done. So I guess we can log off. This is so awkward on the Zoom, right? Because if we're like in a room, it's different, but I think we're done. I'm gonna say goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, thank you so much. Thank you. Sasha, Sasha and Casey, do you wanna hang tight for like two minutes? Come on, Every day. You too, stop recording.